The U.S. should adopt a policy that significantly mitigates global warming. The U.S. should adopt a policy that significantly mitigates global warming. The chair recognizes the leader of the government for a speech not to exceed seven minutes in length. Great. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas Murray, and I'm the Prime Minister of the government. Or Hi, the Thomas. For the proposition side today, however you call it. Um, so I will begin the debate by... Yeah, so I will begin the debate. Um, so in the global warming quiz we took on the first day of class, the survey results showed that 69% of the class voted that the United States should adopt a policy that significantly mitigates global warming. So this was the opinion of all of you guys, including my opponents. Furthermore, 81% of the class thought that reducing carbon emissions is a good policy for mitigating global warming threats. Um, and that is what Glenn and I propose the United States should do today. And that is to institute a progressive carbon tax to significantly mitigate global warming. And I'm going to start with the definitions here. Um, policy is a course of action adopted and pursued by a government. We got these from like dictionary.com, merriam-webster.com. Um, significant is large enough to be noticed or to have an effect. Um, mitigate is to make less severe or painful. Uh, global warming is the recent increase in the world's temperature that is believed to be caused by the increase of in certain gases such as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Who's uh, timing? Progressive is increase in extent or severity. Carbon tax is a tax on businesses and industries that produce carbon dioxide to their operations. Um, and the criteria here are the net benefits are going to be in line with our nation's interests. Um, for the purpose of the brief of this focus will be on the interests of sustainability, diversification, and independence. Um, the justification here is provides neutral grounds for the brief while staying in line with the focus of our nation's core values. And I think by now we all have an idea of how global warming works. Um, increased absorption of infrared radiation by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere leads to surface warming. Carbon is a greenhouse gas, cut the carbon we produce, and we should see less warming. Um, however, to quote directly from the skeptical environmentalist, the question here is not whether man-made CO2 increases global temperature, but by how much. Also unquestionable is the costly effects of global warming. Uh, carbon tax addresses an issue, being global warming, that is not simple in a simple way. It, is also, it also provides a future in renewable technologies as well. Fossil fuels which are burned, which when burned, for energy are large emitters of carbon dioxide and are limited. They are a finite resource and will run out. Renewable energy technology like solar and wind operate on a limitless energy source like the wind and sun, and they also do not emit carbon dioxide. Our time as a human race will come and we must answer for our anthropogenic emissions, so why not begin to address that now? Uh, the skeptical environmentalist goes on to further say that anthropogenic greenhouse effect is not something we can simply wish away. If global warming is coming, we must pay the bill just how small can we keep this bill? His claim that CO2 emissions can be reduced far more cheaply, cheaply or even without cost. Most economists are very skeptical of such arguments. If it was already privately prof, prof, profitable to reduce CO2 emissions, it seems surprising that this has not already been done. And this is why this federally mandated tax is essential, at which point I'm going to turn to the plan here. Um, so this is why we propose a progressive carbon tax in which the tax on carbon emissions steepens the more business increases. Or emits, I'm sorry. It would incorporate elements of a couple different plans. Uh, one being that of Representative Henry A. Waxman, who's our local legislator here in LA, Senator Shel Sheldon Whitehouse, Representative Earl Blumunder, and Senator Brian Schatz released draft carbon pricing legislation. So in this plan, the nation's largest polluters would have to pay an increasing fee for each ton of pollution they release. This was sourced from whitehouse.gov. Uh, a $20 tax per metric carbon per metric ton of carbon emitted would be applied to the 2,869 largest fossil fuel polluters, which are responsible for 85% of the U.S. carbon emissions according to the Congressional Research Service. Uh, revenue from the tax would be allocated for funding for renewable energy research. And the assessment and collection of the carbon fees is based upon the expertise that, already, that has already been developed by the EPA and the Treasury Department. Uh, the EPA's database of reported emissions would determine the amount of pollution subject to the fee. The Treasury Department would be responsible for the collection and handling of the fees. It would be funded from the large emitters. Uh, the legislative intent would be in the words best said by Senator Whitehouse of Rhode Island, who was part of the draft I mentioned earlier, and part of the draft, yeah, uh, putting a car, this is a quote, putting a price on carbon is the best way to reduce carbon pollution and show and slow the effects of climate change. 
For, for far too long, carbon polluters have pushed the true cost of, pollution, of their pollution onto the American people in the form of dirty air, acidified water, and a changing climate. And it would also be in line with Obama's long-term goal, which is the nation's largest investment in clean energy. Um, the plan, as, I, as outlined, would reduce carbon emissions, therefore, thereby reducing global warming while providing additional funding for renewable energy sources. Oil, coal, gas, natural gas, ethanol, and nuclear will cease to be the primary sources of energy for the United States as renewable sources take their place. U.S. carbon emissions will steadily decrease as companies use less fossil fuels to avoid taxation. The institutional pieces are already in place to monitor carbon emissions, like I mentioned with the Treasury Department and EPA, and tax to tax and redistribute money to renewable energy companies. Over time, an emissions tax needs to be adjusted for changes in external circumstances, such as inflation, technological progress, and new emission sources. Fixed emission charges in, transition, in the transition economies of Eastern Europe, for example, have been significantly eroded by high inflation in the past decade, which is why we need this. Um, however, there is some experience with the direct taxation of CO2 emissions. The Nordic Council of Ministers notes that CO2 emissions in Denmark decreased by 6% during the period 1988 to 1997, while the economy grew by 20%. And to conclude with, to those doubting the effects of changes in the amount of carbon in our to those doubting the effect of changes in the amount of carbon in our atmosphere, to which in the year 2012 we alone pumped 6,526 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent, according to the EPA, I like to remind everyone that we have but one spaceship Earth whose very existence, our very existence, is of the most partic particular circumstances. Just take our atmosphere, for example, which allows us organisms to live here and to exist here. It is comprised of minute amounts of super small different chemicals and gases and so forth. Slight changes in one direction or another of these different things in life as we know it doesn't exist. I implore you all to ask yourselves, how many other planets out there have life like we do? It is a precarious balance, and even small changes to our Earth's composition, as I said, would result in us not being here today to debate this wonderful topic. So admittedly, carbon is but one GHG, but like other gases of the atmosphere and world, small changes in their amounts have humongous effects. As custodians of this planet, we have a duty to look after it so that our children and our children's children will be able to have life as we have had. So finally, as our lives and our future children's lives hang in balance, I conclude with a simple question for you all. If not now, when? And it'll, I also believe it is within every man, woman, child, and animal's right to clean air in a healthy planet, and those sh and those rights should not be just limited to those currently living today. That is all. I and know. I now stand open to cross. And that's why I believe that the. That's why I believe the U.S. should adopt a policy that significantly mitigates global warming, and I stand open for cross contamination. Thank you very much. <laughs> Chair recognizes. A period of three minutes of cross-examination in front of the podium, please. Hi, everyone. My name is John, and I uh, thank my um, opponent, Thomas, for giving his speech. So, um, for the sake of time, I politely ask that your answer to the following question to be reduced to a simple yes or no. Yeah. So, um, first of all, it has come to my attention that 13 citations of your sources come from this website called www.skepticalscience.com This source is a husband and wife's blog funded by PayPal donations. The wife has no credentials and the husband openly admits in his bio that he is not a climate scientist and has no background in either climate science or economics. Are you aware of this? No, I'm not even sure I use that source. That's good to know. So, um, here goes my second question. So, um, just to clarify, Thomas, yeah. because you do not give full details on your plan in regards to fee and permit procedures, quantity coverage, excess penalties, state interaction, etc., is it safe to assume that your bill mirrors the um, Waxman, White House, Luminaire, and Chats raft that you cited in your plan portion? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, is it safe to assume that your bill mirrors the Waxman, White House, Luminaire, and Chats raft that you no. cited? No. And no. why is that? Um, as I said, it is a combination of plans. It has parts of the Waxman plan. You're facing the but, audience. Um, We're trying to persuade us. It's not entirely Waxman's plan. It's not entirely, but no. would you say that a large portion of it is from the Waxman plan? I'd say a good portion of it. Okay. So, um, however, I don't know if you know that uh, it has come also to my attention that the Waxman draft in the 113th Congress first session bill to require the payment of a fee for emission of carbon pollution, Section 11 special rules that um, certain industries are exempted from the tar carbon tax, such as biogenic CO2 sites involved in the decomposition of landfill waste and suppliers of natural gas, and some of these fields are among the top 2% in the world in their contribution to global warming. So were you aware that your policy was partially funded by soft corruption? Uh, no. Hmm. That's I'd also good to know. I'd also like to say that 
we that's why we are incorporating different plants together. We have part of wax. Uh, plant. Tell the yourself. audience what you're trying to persuade. For the sake of time, I have to ask my one last question. Go for it. So, um, is it the government's plan for the United States alone to impose a tax based on carbon dioxide? I mean, that's what our debate's about. Are you aware that the United States is not the only country in the global economy? And are you aware that carbon emission has a global nature? Yes. So, um, therefore, are you also aware that other countries have absolutely no obligation and that the United States has absolutely no power to force other countries, other countries to follow its policy? I don't agree with that. Why? And why is that? Why is that? Uh, because according to my research, a lot of um, other um, nations have been engaged in what Justice Brandeis called a race to the bottom, which I will illustrate that later on in my constructive. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs> Chair will now hear from the leader of the opposition for a speech not to exceed seven minutes in length. Are you giving them five, four, three, two, one, half, and fist means shut up. I'm, I'm Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, good. Greetings, everyone, and thank you all for being here today. My name is John, and I am the leader of the opposition. Before Hi, presenting our arguments, we, the opposition, want to first counter the government's definition of the term significant. We suggest that rather than meaning large enough to be noticed or have an effect, significant should be defined as having or likely to have a major effect. Important, large in amount or quantity. We so contend because for debate purposes, significant has always been something more than just notice or having an effect. Distorting such would not only depart from generally accepted debate principles, but also unduly relieve the appropriate burden <coughs> of proof of the government to justify this plan. Now, without further ado, I shall present my central argument. In the government's first construct constructive and my cross-examination, the Prime Minister explained that the damages global warming causes and we strongly agree with that. However, the government fails to solve for these harms. As a government team, the burden to correct these issues lies upon their shoulders. And as we will show, the government not only fails to solve for any of the harms of global warming, but also cripples our economy, decreasing quality of life for American citizens. Observation 1. Carbon tax has negligible impact on global warming. Imposing tax based on carbon emission only addresses a small, if not negligible, component of global warming. To begin with, according to the IPCC, carbon emissions are but one component among other major sources, such as water vapors, methane, mm -hmm. nitrous oxide, and ozone. In other words, the independent impact of carbon emission on global warming, as compared to the combined effect of all other greenhouse gases, can be very, very limited. On top of this relatively minor influence of carbon emissions, according to Professor McKay at the University of Cambridge, those produced by humans only comprise of a minimal 2% of the total carbon dioxide produced. The overwhelming 98% of carbon dioxide are produced within the natural carbon cycle. For instance, plant respiration, volcano eruptions, and decompositions. You might already regard this 2% as trivial. Yet, according to Edgar, a database created by European Commission. The United States alone produced only 16.4% of that insignificant 2% of human carbon emissions. That is, to say, that is to say, the United States is only responsible for a minimal 0.328, guys, 0.328% of carbon dioxide ejected to the atmosphere. With this being said, the government's plan to impose merely a carbon-based tax will at best resolve 0.328% of the total carbon emission, which is but one minor effect of global warming after all. Therefore, the government's plan to reduce global warming is no different from pouring a bottle of water in a running forest fire. The intention is worth phrasing, but its ability to significantly mitigate global warming, not so much. Observation 2. Carbon tax penalizes consumers instead of industries. Given the indispensable nature of war-related products, it will ultimately be us the consumers who will bear the extensive cost of carbon tax, not the industries. The claim is well supported by core economic principles of supply and demand, which dictates that taxation on products with demands inelastic to price. The tax industry can simply increase the selling price of these products, in effect passing 
the cost of taxation to us consumers. According to Critchen, a renowned economist who specializes in carbon-based taxation, our demand for oil related product is a prime example of inelastic commodities. Specifically, because of the indispensable nature of oil related products to our daily life, an increase in their price would not dissuade us from buying them. One great example of a similar commodity is cigarette. Due to, despite high taxation in the past few decades, tobacco companies such as Altria Group that produces Marlboro and British American Tobacco that produces Dunhill still thrive until today. Mar While the very target the cigarette taxation sought to regulate generates immense profit, price of cigarette increase and it is ultimately us the consumers who pay the price. Like our addiction to cigarette, we are addicted to oil related products. In fact, we are even more addicted to these products because they're inseparable to our way of life. Maybe with phenomenal determination, some of us can quit smoking. But most of us could not and would not stop using our cars, stop taking planes, stop using plastic, stop using our refrigerators, and stop even using our air conditioning. Therefore, as in the case of cigarette companies, carbon producing industries can willfully pass the cost of taxation to us consumers. The government's plan to in, to take I'm sorry, the government's plan to reduce carbon emission by imposing seed carbon tax would fail because it did not take into account of core economic principles. Since past experience in cigarette uh, has already proved how ill calculated taxes are, I would like to ask my fellow voters, what is the merit of a plan that will make you pay more for absolutely nothing? And what could possibly be the reason to vote yes on such a plan. Observation 3. A unilateral carbon tax is impractical in a global economy. It is unlikely that such a plan would, as the government claim, set a workable model for other nations to follow. Why is that? Because decades of experience in labor regulation revealed that the government's plan will only lead to what political scientists and what Justice Brandeis of the Supreme Court would identify as a race to the bottom. Specifically, in desperate need of foreign direct investments, the numerous developing countries were entangled in a race to lowest labor regulation to attract multinational corporations. Providing this unsuccessful, unsuccessful experience, it is only reasonable to accept, you know, a similar race to lowest or no carbon tax at all. Hence, with this race to the bottom of carbon regulations, the government's plan in practice actually induced consequences contrary to its efforts expectations. In summary, I have demonstrated in my constructive that firstly carbon tax, which at best dresses 0.328% of total carbon emission, has a negligible impact on global warming. Secondly, carbon tax penalizes us consumers instead of these industries. Thirdly, a unilateral carbon tax imposed by the United States without the corporation, cooperation of other countries faces insurmountable practical difficulties such as the race to the bottom. And it is, let me finish, thank you. And it is precisely due to these reasons that we, the opposition, while agreeing with the government's position that global warming should be reduced, contends that the government's plan to unilaterally impose carbon tax would not significantly mitigate global warming. Thank you all for listening, and I now stand open for cross-examination. Thank you very much. <laughs> Chair will now entertain a cross-examination of three minutes. In front of the podium, please. I'm still Thomas. Um, so I'm going to do some yes or no questions too, taking after you and that. Um, so would you agree that there are a lot of different factors that go into influencing global warming? Face the audience, please. Yes. Okay. Would you say carbon is one of them? Yes, but a very insignificant one of them. Would you say that it's completely understood how all these factors work in concert to produce global warming? I would say so in large extent because uh, a, univers a university professor, very renowned one from Cambridge, said so. Okay. Would you agree the IPCC comes out with new reports, right? And our models not constantly being updated? Yes, and um, actually if you look into my citation, mine is from the fifth annual assessment report of the IPCC, which is the latest report. So it reflects the new information we're getting, correct? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, all right. And um, do you believe global warming is an issue currently? Yes, I do believe that. Okay. Do you think global warming affects everyone? 
Yes, I do believe that. That's why I believe that it is important to have an effective plan that significantly mitigates the global warming, <laughs> but not a plan that only, you know, doesn't mitigate okay. at all. Okay. Then affecting everyone, you agree, would you say that global warming is significant in its effect? Yes, I would agree with that. Okay. Then must we not do something to address global warming? Yes, we should, but I just don't think your way is the effective way, as I have demonstrated in my constructive. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chair will now hear from the member of the government for a speech not to exceed seven minutes in length. Hear, hear. Good afternoon, classmates, Professor Miller, and members of the opposition. Treat this world as a, as a ball rather than a blanket. And although we do emit insignificant amount in number for carbon, if the amount of carbon that goes in are less than the amount of carbon that goes, sorry, amount, the amount of carbon that goes in is more than the amount of carbon that goes out, our Earth will lose its balance. As my first speaker has said, the Earth works in a very complicated balance, that even a very small amount of carbon emitted in the, in the atmosphere would change the balance in the world, and a small temperature as one Celsius degree would definitely change the balance of the Earth, which is why global warming is such an issue right now. So, from that, let me go to my first contention to the opposition. They mentioned that the U.S. only has a very insignificant effect in number if we implement carbon tax. That carbon only accounts for 2% two, two of, of uh, greenhouse gases, and only 16.4% of that is from the U.S. Let me address the part where they say U.S. is very insignificant. U.S., as we all know, is the second to China in polluting uh, carbon emission. And, and a lot of Chinese, uh, China's uh, carbon emission comes from manufacture. And ma manufacture in China goes a lot to the West, including the U.S. Alexander Harney from International uh, Affairs Fellow of Council of Foreign L L Relations stated in her book, The China Prize, the China manufacturer are fueled by the West, ranging from cheap clothing to electronic filling in the shelves of Walmart. And also, in fact, 35% of China's manufacturer lands on the United States, according to Senator Sherrod Brown, who enacted the Currency Exchange Rate Oversight Reform Act of 2011. So, classmates, we have to be aware that the United States plays a big role in the world in terms of carbon emission. And we, I, I, I would like to state that global warming is indeed a global issue. Everyone has to work together uh, to um, mitigate global warming. And the thing is, uh, U.S. is very lacking. Uh, U.S. lag in, uh, in, in their effort to um, mitigate global warming. Look at Kyoto Protocol, for example, an international agreement linked to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. According to the uh, United States Framework Convention on Climate Change, the United States never signed nor ratified Kyoto Protocol since 2005, which, w which was enacted in 2012. U.S., among a, a lot of developing countries, did not sign it. But even in 2005, a lot of developing countries ratified Kyoto Protocol. And U.S. and Australia are the only countries that did not ratify Kyoto Protocol. So we do not have an external force that drive us to mitigate climate change. We, it all solely depends on us to, um, to um, mitigate climate change. And that's why we want to enact a uh, carbon tax. And second of all, the opposition mentioned that carbon tax will penalize uh, consumers instead of industries. And they actually give a very good example of cigarettes. People are very addicted to cigarettes, and we are addicted to oils. But that is what we want to change. We should not be that addicted to cars, plastic bags, um, and other uses of oil. What we, we're trying to do is we're not eliminating all of them. We're trying to reduce them and, and at the same time develop renewable energy so that we have a sustainable earth that we can live in the long term. As what, as what my first speaker has said, countries like Japan and Germany, for example, has been carbon have, have has been capping a carbon emission <coughs> while simultaneously developing re renewable energy um, uh, resources. And also, according to the International Energy Agency, in 2012, the global fossil fuel subsidies totaled uh, 544 billion dollars, while those renewable accounted only for 101 billion. In our uh, policy, we're trying to. Um, fund renewable energy so that we could have a sustainable earth. 
And lastly, the opposition stated that unilateral carbon tax is impractical in global economy. Yes, we do agree that we can't act alone, but classmates, let's remember that we are a superpower country. We have a, a lot of impact that we can bring to the world. If we are the one who first implement such things as this, and if, if and when it, if it works, it will. Uh, we would be the first who, who uh, and other countries could model us uh, for carbon taxation. And let me restate again that we are very lagging in, in mitigating carbon um, um, carbon emissions. So therefore, we need something to um, to mitigate carbon emission. And let me move on to um, the solvency argument of carbon emission. Basically, carbon, carbon, sorry, carbon taxation. Carbon taxation actually improves predictability, and carbon taxation is also easy to understand because a, a, the, the, the important part of a bill is, is that we all are going to vote for it. If we don't understand the bill, the bill itself would not pass. But we believe that carbon taxation is actually pretty simple because it's it's transparent and easy to understand. The government simply imposes tax per ton carbon emitted, which is easily translated into a tax per kilowatt of electricity, gallon of gasoline, and therm of natural gas. And therefore, uh, we believe that carbon tax is very easy to understand and therefore would easily pass it, uh, pass the bill. And also, Robert Shapiro, chair of the co-founder of U.S. Climate Task Force and former under Secretary of Commerce for Economic Affairs stated that with carbon taxes ramped up through a multi-year phase in, future energy, power, energy and power prices can be predicted with a reasonable degree of confidence well ahead of time. So this proves that carbon uh, tax is actually very easy to predict. And also carbon tax applies to a lot of sectors. As my first speaker has mentioned, that we will tackle the largest emitters in the United States, which will tackle a, a, a different various um, um, sectors in, in the industry. Now, let me move on to my arguments why we should apply carbon tax. Kazmet, this, this is the right time to apply it. Like, like my first speaker has stated, when are we going to uh, implement carbon tax? Because we're, we're dependent on a finite resources, and one day these finite resources will, uh, will go away. And if we don't do anything now, if we don't limit it now, we would suffer in the long term. Yes, there will be some economic impact in the in the short term, but in the long term, if we run out of these oil, these fos these fossil fuels, we would have a greater economic impact, and we would not be able to survive. What we are trying to do is that we're trying to um, implement um, renewable energy, so we have a uh, we have we have sustainable earth. So based so based on my uh, speech today, I believe that we have proven that U.S. should adopt policy that significantly mitigates global warming. And I now stand for uh, cross examination. Thank you very much. Chair will now entertain a cross examination in front of the podium for a period not to exceed three minutes in length. <laughs> My name is Ian. Hi, Ian. Hey, Ian. Hi. <laughs> to start off, you mentioned a couple times that... Uh, Over here, Ian. I apologize. The government team mentioned multiple times that they were using an IPCC report from uh, 2000, uh, 2007. It is the Contribution of Working Group 3. Is this correct? Yep. All right. Are you aware that that, that has actually been mitigated and has actually been changed? Yep. You are? Okay. Now, the interesting thing about that is... The 2014 report on the exact same topic has actually changed their tune. Uh, it says directly that the IPCC's discussions on how carbon tax markets uh, carbon tax creates market instability and fuels negative economic conditions, and instead actually says that investment subsidies, technological provisions, and everything in that regard are significantly more impactful. Uh, were you guys aware of this also? Yep. So why still go with the carbon tax when the IPCC themselves have said that it is not solvent? The problem with the 2014 IPCC is that the plan that they're, the carbon tax that they apply is not similar to ours. Ours is a progressive tax, and we would uh, implement more on renewable energy. While, car while the IPCC report in 2014 focuses on how the impact, of ec the economic impact, which is very insignificant in our policy. It's interesting because you say that your tax is progressive, but you propose that you would tax at twenty dollars per uh, per metric ton, correct? Right, correct. And there's no different bracketing, correct? No. So that's not a progressive tax. No. Yes. Yes, it is progressive tax. No, it's not. <laughs> progressive is different brackets. We, we, start, we start at 20, yes. Next question, please. Okay, so on to the next material. Um, 
the government team talks about how there would be seven, seventy billion dollars contributed to economic uh, economic stimulus of green energies and things like that. Uh, this is correct, right? No. No. It says in your brief specifically, uh, seventy billion dollars will be spent in the form of tax cuts and funding on green energy. That is from your brief. I believe that is not part of our plan. It is part of the example that we give. No, that's that's part of the brief from this plan. Okay, moving on. Then. <laughs> Actually, okay, last one example then. Um, the government team talked about Denmark before and how they had implemented a CO2 emissions reduction program and they decreased emissions by 6% and the economy had grown by 20%. This is true, right? Correct. Uh, are you also aware that this is during the 90s? Right? Correct. Okay. Are you also aware that every single nation in that zone, even the ones that did not implement a similar program, also experienced a similar boom? Exactly, because that was a, that, that was that was not the correct that, that is not a very similar program uh, that we were trying to implement. So, we learned from their mistakes. So basically, the carbon tax had absolutely nothing to do with the economic boom then, because the countries that did not have that exact same yes, tax that's in their plan, not in our plan. Because you're also aware that Denmark did not actually have much carbon emission period. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The chair will now recognize the member of the opposition for a speech not to exceed seven minutes in length. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here today. Uh, as we all know, we're here to discuss the carbon tax plan. Uh, I'd like to thank the opposition, or the government team, for coming up with such a great plan. I'd like to thank my teammate also for staying up late nights with me and helping me uh, take it down. <laughs> As we've seen, just from the cost examination here, a lot of their data is flawed. A lot of their data is old. We've also seen that a lot of the data just doesn't pan out or it's simply untrue. The government team has said multiple times that all these harvests from global warming will affect us. And we don't disagree with that. Global warming is a terrible thing. It should be mitigated. It should be mitigated significantly. That is not what we are trying to debate here. We are trying to debate that their policy does nothing of the sort. It is not solvent. It does not solve for the harms. Now, our first harm in this regard, implemented by their policy, is that implementation of carbon tax directly, directly negatively impacts the United States' economy. This hypothesis is called the Porter Hypothesis, which is commonly cited by economists, stating that strict environmental regulations can induce efficiency and, and encourage innovation that help improve commercial competitiveness. This is a good thing for economic sanctions in this regard. However, this hypothesis has been disproven multiple times. Most recently and most effectively by Stefan et al. showing that the environmental regulation leads to reductions in productivity and profitability. This reduction can impact the United States economy in one of two ways. The second point being a little less likely. Though. The first way in which it can impact our economy is that companies seeking to increase or reestablish their profits and alleviate the burden of taxes will move to foreign soil. If a company moves to another nation, they still put out the same amount of carbon emissions. They still go into our atmosphere. They still affect global warming. It doesn't help us at all if the company simply moves. It actually just hurts us because now our economy is being crippled by this fact. This increases unemployment, reduction in RDI, which is real disposable income, meaning there's less money in individuals' pockets. It decreases GDP, or gross domestic product, which hurts our economy even further. And by hurting all of these things simultaneously, we actually create exactly the conditions that lead to every single depression that we've ever experienced in our United States of America. The, company, the government's plan leads to depression. That's kind of depressing. This will destroy our nation's fortunes, livelihoods, and, uh, and lives. This is a very significant impact. And for such a steep tax, and for losing that many jobs and creating unemployment at that, many, at that rate, we have to make sure that we do not vote for this. The impact, too, the one that is slightly less likely, is that companies will decide, decide to stay on foreign soil and pay the tax. This is still not a good thing, because the only way they can afford to pay this tax is either to reduce their emissions, yes, which reduces productivity in order to reduce the tax's impact, or remain at the current level of emissions and productivity and pass down the tax's impact to, to consumers. If they reduce carbon emissions and reduce productivity, they incur the same penalties as point one. The reason is because they're not changing over to a new form of productivity. They're not changing over. There's no implementation in this plan of changing the actual fundamentals in a company or changing the, uh, I apologize, the infrastructure in the company. There is no point and there is no plan for in the government for that. On the other side, if companies decide to just pay the tax and continue emitting carbon, the government gets a little bit richer, but on the, sa on the other side, there's no solvency, there's no effect on global warming or carbon emissions whatsoever. So in another regard, they're not solvent. 
Now, harm two is the implementation of the carbon tax lacks solvency due to the largest companies and thus the largest carbon, carbon producers' ability to ignore and simply pay the carbon tax. This carbon tax is directly targeted at the largest carbon producers. So these are also the most profitable companies in the nation. One of which is United, United States Steel Corporation, which comes in at $4.4 .4 billion for this quarter alone, according to their uh, news releases. So $4.4 .4 billion in profits from this one quarter. The staggering amount of money makes carbon tax negligible for companies such as this. Now, U.S. Steel also produces 1.8 tons of carbon for every one ton of steel. That's massive. The U.S. Steel, uh, US Steel Corporation has distributed 5.1 million tons of steel just this quarter. Now, if you factor this in and look at the carbon tax rate that the government has proposed, then at most, U.S. Steel will pay $180 million, which is absolutely nothing compared to $4.4 million in, or $4.4 billion in profits. In profits. If you're going to reduce your profits, you know, are you going to reduce your profits to pay, you know, to avoid the small little tax? It's negligible. It doesn't hurt. And you need to make sure that freaking you're, you're actually creating incentive for these companies to reduce their carbon emissions. This is not one. Disadvantage A. The efficacy of carbon tax is difficult, if not impossible, to judge. Now, this has been seen by the IPCC multiple times, and they're actually the ones who, uh, who are reciting in this regard. Because carbon tax offers a choice of whether to decrease emissions or to pay the tax, the efficacy decreases the, prediction, uh, the predictions for oil prices and economic models become more erratic. Now, the government team has talked multiple times about how this is a very transparent model, how everything in this regard, everything in this regard is very transparent and very easy to see, and it's very simple. Yet, what it exa exactly what it does is it creates much less stability in our economy. It actually makes our economy much less transparent. There's a lot more. Uh, there's a lot more insolvency, there's a lot more speculation as to oil prices. Because of all these issues, the economy becomes erratic, and our nation does not have the standardized practice of measuring carbon emissions by a company anyways. Meaning that, if a company were to do, reduce carbon emissions and pay a lower tax due to the reduction, it would be impossible to note the extent at which emissions were reduced. If the company were to eliminate emissions altogether, it would still be unknown due to no established baseline. The impact of this is the oversight of carbon tax would be not impossible due to the serious lack of information allowing for no means of adjustment in tax rates, means of determining qualifications for exemption of subsidies, or methods of determining whether the carbon tax becomes a necessary burden upon the public enterprise in the future. This tax could go out of hand, it could destroy our economy, and there's no way of actually regulating it, no way of enforcing there's, there's enforcement and that's it. There's no way for voters to know whether it's actually being solvent, there's no way for the government to actually detect if we should change rates or anything. <coughs> this lack of... <laughs> This lack of oversight and transparency is unacceptable in American governmental structure. Disadvantage B. The United States is already under significant economic strain due to the unemployment and a large na national deficit and the recent loss of our S&P AAA rating in 2011. A loss in the United States AAA rating has been directly linked to the decrease in the U.S. dollar's strength internationally. And America's oil dependence on the Middle East necessitates our nation to buy oil from foreign distributors regardless of cost. This is just what our, my partner was talking about, an elasticity of, of carbon demand, or oil demand. When the U.S. dollar is weak internationally, oil producer, producing countries increase their price to maintain profit margins. The impact of this is that the increase in, in oil compounds with, the, uh, compounds with the carbon tax, when gasoline, lubricants, plastics, and all the petroleum products skyrocket in price, impacting every single person, whether it be industry or individuals. For all these reasons that we've shown, please vote for the government and for the opposition. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. The chair will now hear a cross examination in front of the podium, not to exceed three minutes in length. Good afternoon. Um, my first question is um, so you're saying that large companies would simply pay taxes to emit more carbon, correct? So large companies would simply pay the taxes so they could emit more carbon because they're large companies, correct? Right, they can ignore it. Yes. And help. you're aware that companies are very profit-based, yes? Absolutely. And so they would have less profit because they would tax, they would just simply pay taxes for more carbon emission, correct? They would pay the tax because they don't want to reduce their profits. All right. So you do aware that, um, and you also, are you also aware that government plans is only to tax large emitters? Yes. Absolutely. And you are also aware that large companies are mostly those who produce products that are elastic in nature. Yes. No. Why so? Because gasoline is a very large company, and everything. The products of, ga of of those gas prices. 
the products are what we the consumers buy. Okay. So you must agree that inelastic goods would not be affected significantly. Again, I disagree. If you disagree, then why are you uh, are you aware of the market affected here? It's mostly actually elastic goods. Okay, say that one more time. That the market that is affected here are actually more, mostly elastic goods. Again, as we've shown in our research, that's not true. Okay. You Plastics also mentioned that our economy is in turmoil, correct? Say that again. Our economy is currently in turmoil, correct? Yes, yes. And you also mentioned that we are dependent in the middle, middle East for oil, yes? Yes, we are. So essentially, disregarding our oil reserve, we are not energy independent, yes? That's true right now. You also mentioned that carbon tax would affect oil prices to be volatile, correct? Very much so. And you're also aware that, that well, we are dependent on finite energy resources. Yes. So based on your hy hypothesis, we are dependent uh, for oil, that if we one day run out of this oil, our economy, our economy will be very much affected, yes? Which is why the government should do something to solve that, and not just impose a useless tax. Therefore, the impact of the economy would be much worse when we run out of oil compared to currently, yes? Yes. And oil... And you also mentioned that oil and petroleum are also used in the production of plastics, correct? Yes. And if we tax them, it would affect the prices of petroleum pro products. Yes. Are you, fair, are you, are you fair, aware that plastics are mainly used for packaging? That's not true at all. It plastics is. are used for everything. On the, yes. Every object in this room probably contains some trace amount of plastic. And you're aware that government is trying to cur curb the use of commercial plastics, yes? No, they're not. Yes, they are. We, um, we don't use plastic bags anymore. In, for, in, for example, in uh, grocery stores. Are you that's, aware that's of how many counties actually do that? And are you aware that the, of the Keystone pip Pipeline project? Yes. And uh, on the, the, uh, most of the harm that you mentioned regarding poor people and petroleum products is based on the, the source of the Heritage Foundation you mentioned are also due to Obama's denial to the pipeline, not only from carbon tax. Denial to the pipeline? Right. How so? Like denial of its existence? <laughs> no, Obama did not approve. Of this public yes, project, that's true. yes, and the, as that the the, re, the 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 source that you put is thank you, thank you, thank you very much. It's now time for refutation and rebuttal. Chair will entertain the leader of the government for a rebuttal of four step. Refutation, ahead, not man. to exceed <laughs> four <laughs> minutes in we'll, length. We'll try to do that. All right. So just to address one of uh, my opponent's points really quick about the data being flawed or missing, um, we believe it's because such a plan as this has never been put together. So just simply that. Um, our opponents equate our dependence on carbon emitters to America's dependence on cigarettes, whose use of which has never been lower, uh, thanks in part to the tax we imposed on them. And why did we impose this tax on them? in part to dissuade the public from smoking because of their known health risks. This tax on carbon is no different. It similarly will dissuade people from partaking in su supporting these carbon emitters known to be bad for our health and our planet's health. And our opponents assert that carbon emissions are one part of many different things in greenhouse gases that factor into global warming. Uh, part of why carbon is one factor amongst many others is that there are many different things that influence global warming. Uh, it's partly a relativity thing. As the science develops and new technologies are developed, we learn new things that affect the global climate, such as seen in each new IPCC report. Uh, even minute changes in carbon levels can affect global temperatures severely, because as NASA asserts, greenhouse gases themselves amplify their own effects. So this can result in changes in global temperatures even by one degree or so that can drastically change the face of our planet, and it has kind of a snowball-like effect. Um, our opponents say the measurement of carbon emissions will be difficult, and we disagree with this claim. And we state that the EPA already measures this and would continue to do so under our plan. And finally, we must stop CO2 pollution across the board. Yes, it's complicated and it will be interesting to play out, but right now it's one of the few options we have. And it ought to be enacted because what else is there to stop a few people from wrecking all of humanity's air if the government doesn't stand in to protect us? Like I concluded with my opening statement, air is a universal resource for life on the planet, and precious resources need protections. Part of these protections ought to be fiscal consequences for the violation of everyone's air. Businesses need to grow and adapt to a cleaner environment. If they're getting rich at the cost of all, at all society's health, they ought to suffer. Well into the future, we'll look back and I think we'll agree we made the right decision. If we heat up the planet, only species who can tolerate the heat will survive. This means we must contend with tougher conditions for less food. All in all, a fat purse for rich corporations should not cause humanity to suffer. And to those who say this tax may make us suffer in terms of welfare, I implore these same individuals to try to live in a world in 100 years' time if we continue to pollute the environment the way we, we do. And uh, with that, those are my remarks.
Thank you. Thank you very much. The chair will now recognize the leader of the opposition for a rebuttal of four-step refutation not to exceed four minutes in length. Hi, everyone. My name is John. So, Hi, John. Um, the Prime Minister of the government again stated the importance of us to mitigate global warming. Yes, we agree with that. It is important and, in fact, imperative to reduce carbon emission and therefore mitigate global warming. But we're not voting on if, we, if that is important or not. We're voting on a plan that will solve for that problem. However, as I, as I have demonstrated in my constructive and as my partner Ian has demonstrated in his, we, the government's plan did not do that. Because, again, I want to mention that only 0.328% of the artificial carbon emissions are produced by the United States. And we can only mitigate that amount if we're imposing a unilateral tax. My opponent, my opponent said that decreasing one degree Celsius of the global temperature will make a huge impact. While the, the reality is that the government's plan would not even reduce even one degree Celsius. The government's plan, as I have shown, only decreases 0.3348% of the carbon emissions. That would reduce like only half of 1%, or even less than that, according to our research sources. Therefore, I don't think their plan will significantly mitigate global warming. Also, my opponents stated that although we are addicted to cigarettes and oil-related products, we, should, we shouldn't be addicted. Well, I agree with that. We are addicted, and we should not be addicted. But different from the government, I acknowledge, instead of dodge, the practical reality that quitting is hard. It is because quitting is hard, the oil companies could take advantage of our, vulnera of our vulnerabilities and pass the tax burden to us consumers. Yes, we can quit, but this takes time. It would not be able to significantly deter oil companies to stop oil, I mean carbon emissions, and therefore mitigate global warming in the short run. Also, my opponent Glenn stated that um, although he acknowledges that, um, it is a unilateral tax effort. However, we should do that nonetheless. My past experiences in labor regulation shows otherwise. The U.S. is a leading company, I mean a leading country, in championing labor standards. And the U.S. have started doing that in the exact same way as my opponent wishes the United States to do in this case. However, this, is, this, does, this does not lead to an increased labor standards and regulation in the world. For example, in countries like China, in which labor centers are so poor that it even positively suppress workers. Some even committed suicide. Is that the effect that you want? Is that the result that you wish to achieve? This phenomenon, coined by Justice Brandeis many, many, many years ago, already known by political scientists and proved by them, and it is continuing to be relevant in, in, uh, in contemporary society, shows that the U.S. unilaterally and singularly championing that cost would not let other nations to follow this model. It would not. This is plain reality, as I have plainly demonstrated in my example of labor regulation in China. Also, I want to mention that my opponent wanted to impose a 20 uh, carbon tax. However, are you guys aware that in Maryland, a 5 bucks tax merely already moved a lot of Maryland businesses to move to other states to evade that tax? So it is only logical for us to assume that when you impose a 20 bucks carbon tax, all the other country, all the other oil companies who produce so much, so much oil and would be hurt so severe by these tax, will move to overseas tax havens. If, instead of now, we don't call it tax haven, we call it carbon haven. And that is my point, and thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Chair will now hear the member of the government for rebuttal of four-step refutation, not to exceed four minutes in length. Good afternoon, classmates. I would like to address four points that the opposition addressed. First of all, the opposition addressed that carbon tax is not transparent. We believe that carbon tax is indeed transparent because it is simple and the public has access to it. And the public has an, has an obligation as public watchdogs. Companies, they're not only profit-oriented, they're also 
reputation oriented because they want they want to have a good reputation in the public. And if they try to do tax havens, avoiding taxes, it would look bad in their in, in their in, in their image, and that would look uh, that would uh, affect the consumers not to buy their products or affect consumers uh, to despise them. And therefore, we believe that tax uh, carbon taxes actually, actually uphold transparency, and it, it would uh, the public would be the watchdog for that. Opposition also mentioned that our plan would not work in mitigating global warming. Yes, I, I acknowledge that both sides agree that we have to mitigate climate change, but we we stated this a lot of times that we want to improve renewable energies and that's why we want to tax those companies the, the profit that we make from those companies would go to renewable energies because we have to work together with other countries as well as i said before we are very lagging in our effort to uh, mitigate glo uh, global warming and this is one plan that u.s could do D funny that the opposition mentioned how maryland taxes five dollars California currently taxes twenty dollars, and California is the only state that taxes that that um taxes that has such tax the high taxes compared to other states. And it's ridiculous that our country spent millions of dollars for military, but they do not have any concerns about global warming, which my first speaker has stated affects our life entirely. And also the opposition keeps mentioning how our plan is unilateral. Our plan is not unilateral, ladies and gentlemen. We are trying to implement a new, uh, a new um, uh, policy that would affect all developing countries. We, are, we as developed countries have responsibility to promote a new kind of uh, renew, renewable energies. And the only way to do this is c through carbon tax. Because through carbon tax, we not only mitigate carbon emission that we uh, uh, we not only mitigate carbon emission, but we also develop new renewable energy resources. And if we are successful in that, we could help developing countries to use our technology. Uh, Japan, for example, in their effort to, um, in their Kyoto Protocol, uh, Masuiti from National Institute of Environmental Studies reports the effect and tax of se sectoral subsidy regime for Japan to achieve Kyoto target by 2010, in which carbon revenues are used to subsidize additional investment to reduce greenhouse gases. And as, as a result, they have improved in a lot of sectors. They improved in industrial sectors. They improved in tra transportation sector. They uh, managed to create waste plastic injection blast furnace and hybrid cars. So this is what we're trying to impose. And therefore, I believe that uh, we, we, the government, has proven to you that our policy carbon tax significantly reduce global warming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheryl now here from the member of the opposition for a rebuttal in four-step refutation, not to exceed four minutes in length. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for all being here. And uh, thank you for staying with us for this whole entire debate. It's actually been pretty fun. So, the the, to really quickly quote some uh, things that the government team has said very, very recently, they talk about that the tax is, a, is simple and is transparent. I mean, they say that the watchdogs, uh, the public will be the watchdogs. So, now we have moved from the EPA doing regulation to the public having to keep an eye on this. And we've seen constantly that. One public doesn't actually check on things like this. Are any of you, you going to go and measure the carbon emissions of one of these corporations? Because I don't want to take the time to do that. That's not my job. Um, it's not transparent. We've shown through multiple, uh, multiple theories of research that the economy is going to become much more unstable, that oil prices will become unstable, that public speculation will become unstable. There's nothing transparent or simple about this plan. Next, to correct a, a small thing, the government team has recently said that California taxes at $20 per ton of uh, carbon emissions. It's actually not true. It's flat not true. Uh, California actually ta taxes at $0.05. Cents. The highest state tax right now is actually Maryland, which taxes at $5 per ton. No one does $20 right now. That would be ludicrous because it's so incredibly expensive. Um, now, to also the government team has said recently that they, this will affect all countries. Now, if this actually could affect all countries, if the, gov if the U.S. government had the ability to impose this tax upon all, all countries, this plan might actually be solvent. Sadly, though, the U.S. government does not have the ability to impose a tax in another country. 
We can't do that. We cannot guarantee that any of these models will be followed by another country. And to be honest, the democratic and the, cons the capitalistic model that America uses is not often emulated by other nations. We are not really a, a leader in policies, we are a, a leader in actions. Also, the government team has talked about how we are going to help other countries get our technology because of all this funding. We're going to innovate our own green technology and give it to other nations. But we already have some forms of green technology right now, and Africa has not yet benefited from much of that right now anyways. Their technology is still rather bad. They don't really have a lot of solar. Their carbon emissions are extremely high. So how is a tax going to fix this? How is a tax going to affect our relations with another nation or any of this? Now, in closing, there's a few things this that I think are the, the predominant voters in this, uh, in this decision. These are the things that I believe that you as the audience are going to have to uh, use to determine whether the government wins or the opposition wins in this argument. One of the primary things is the effect of the economy. Now, we've already shown that the, the economy, while the government does get a small tax out of all these things, they get some money out of that, the government gets a little bit richer and all of our, economy, all of our corporations go down the drain. We've shown how this is linked to a destruction of our economy, how it leads to a depression eventually because of a reduction in GDP, RDI, and unemployment. Companies leaving our shores and going to other shores. And we now have no jobs, no money in our pocket, no disposable income, that's a pressure, ladies and gentlemen. Another, another thing that I believe that everyone should be voting on for this is quality of life. We have shown, because plastics are such a predominant portion of this, and also gasoline prices would rise and everything like this, that the poor and the impoverished are strongly affected by this tax due to their reliance on petroleum-based products and gasoline. This is hurting the, the, bottom, the bottom couple percent of our nation. Are we really going to, to affect and tax the individuals who can afford at least? Are we really going to... Plastics are one of the cheaper products that we have. Paper, plastic plates, plastic forks, things of that nature. We use them in everyday lives. And it's much easier for someone who's rich to alter their lifestyle and go to a different, to a different uh, medium. But for someone who doesn't have the money, there's no way that they can change their lifestyle. They're affected by this, plain and simple. Lastly, we have to vote on this. Is this a serious mitigation of global warming? Are the incentives really there for, for companies to decrease? Or would they just go to another, another country? Would they just go somewhere else and do the same polluting into our same atmosphere? from another location. For all these reasons, I would like to appeal you to your common sense and to show that this plan doesn't work, plain and simple. For all these reasons, please vote for the opposition. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's give them all another round of applause. Yeah, very nice. Now it's time to shift the arena to the judges who will look over their notes and their individual ballots. And individual deliberation. No, uh, Arnold, don't look on someone else's decision. Thank you. Put blinders on. Thank you. How do you get What? Oh, okay, yeah, right. Okay, thank you. Have a stapler? Want me to go borrow one? No. It's not that important. Yeah.
No one has a mini stapler on it. If you have a stapler, you can carry one. You think that'd be a good idea? Yeah, a little, yeah, a little one. Yeah. So if I ever need it, you'll have it. Oh, you need a ballot? Anybody else need a ballot? Oh, nice. Very nice. Very nice. Still one over here or no? You both fill them out. So we just have one more. Okay. Yes. You have two more or just one more? Mr. Lavi, have you filled yours out? Okay. Is there any more ballots to come in? On a 1 to 23 decision, the decision goes to the opposition. We'll start over here on this side. Hi, Christina. Mine's a vote for the opposition. At first, when you guys started your argument, I was like, okay, this is really good, nothing can yeah. beat that. But then when mm -hmm. John came to speak, and he, he just uh, basically you said that it's, it's a good policy, but it's not as effective as something else, that just took me away to your side. So that's pretty much my opinion. But everyone spoke really well, and everything, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I vote for the government. Yeah! <laughs> wow! The lone defense. Yeah. Um, the lone ranger. The lone ranger. Well, to be fair, I missed Tom's opening speech, but uh, still won me over with the reputation. Um, I felt like... Uh, the government was giving us more uh, facts to back up things, and I kept hearing things from the opposition like, uh, it's going to like lower GDP, it's going to lower the economy, it's going to cause a depression, and it was very like doomsday for me. Um, and I didn't hear a lot of stuff backing up why those things were going to happen. Um, I thought the government did a really good job of supporting it, and I felt like both were very professional delivery, as, as well as the opposition was a very professionally delivered debate, and a little bit more heated than the last one. Okay, thank you. Yes, please. All right. Uh, I'm Nathan. Hi, Nathan. Uh, I'm sorry, Thomas. Everybody did a really good job, like presenting all your facts very well. I just, I just couldn't help but, you know, side with the opposition because um, you just pointed out too many flaws. And even if you, you know, 
tax these companies that can just move elsewhere and it still affects the environment negatively, which you guys both agree on. So, uh, happy to go through you guys. Thank you very much. Yes, please. My name is Aziz. Hi, Aziz. Hey, Aziz. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I think you guys, I'm not even going to say anything. Um, you guys, <laughs> cross-examination, office cross-examination is what really impressed me. It's just like you guys, yeah. it, that's where your strength was. I'm not going to, I feel bad now. <laughs> I'm not going to go do it. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Jenna. Hi, Jenna. Um, I think that, well, I went with the opposition, obviously. Um, I think that you guys, everyone did a good job. Um, you guys had a clear clear speech and clear arguments. I just feel like you guys, like your cross-examinations, rebuttals, and you guys are like really good public speakers, especially Eon, you're really, really strong with everything you said, and I felt like you guys came to each, of each, each and every claim that they did and showed us why they were faulty or why the evidence wasn't good enough. And um, just one thing, like, Ian, I felt like you're really good, but I felt like you're mean at sometimes. Like, your facial expressions <laughs> and, like, some comments that you said were, like, a little bit extra, but, like, all in all, you did really good. Okay. I was told that a lot, actually, in the big competitions, too. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm yeah. told of an ass. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Let's talk about that for just a second. Not, not, not Ian in particular. But we had that mentioned to other people occasionally, and it can be an issue, it can be a factor, and you want to watch it because you don't want to become the issue. You want to let your arguments be the issue, and you don't want to let your presentation and your arrogance or nastiness, or I'm not saying that was Ian, uh, become something that's noticeable. You just don't need that. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Christine. Hi, Christine. Um, not to repeat what everyone's been saying, but I'm going to... Yeah, let's try to have so, a new comment for each um, person. Oh, okay. Well, I'll um, try. But, yeah, <laughs> try. Um, well, I did vote for the opposition. I felt you guys were very good at pointing out the flaws and systematically kind of going through them, and I appreciated that. Like, It felt very logical and uh, patterned to me, and so it was easier for me to follow. Yeah. Um, also, Ian, very good cross-examination. I was so glad that was not me. Um, and everyone had just really good speeches. I felt like they were really well researched, and you all did. Everyone did a good job at presenting the facts. So I appreciated that. Yeah. Let's uh, go to the corner. Yeah. Nivian. Hi, Nivian. Hey, Nivian. What's up? Um, I think, in all fairness to the government, I think you guys were arguing different things, both of them, and that might just be. I might take do an argument like the way you do it because I'm not experienced in debate. You were literally arguing that the U.S. should adopt a policy that significantly mitigates global warming, and they were arguing that you're you're you're. They were agreeing with that resolution, like, throughout that. But they were saying that your policy wasn't... Uh, so I don't think, like, you knew as much that... Um, because, I mean, if I was in your place, I could, I could like, very really confuse the audience by saying, do you agree that the U.S. should adopt the policy? They'll be like, yeah. I'm like, Exa that, that's my case. Like, it's... You could, because I, I think there's a great deal of confusion in what you were debating, that you weren't debating so much your policy itself, but the fact that the U.S. should do this because in later stuff like that, and they were debating your thing, which I think in a policy debate, that's what you're supposed to do, but I don't think you were that aware of it, so I would probably make the same mistakes that you probably made, so I thought it was a, I mean, it's very one-sided, but you guys were literally arguing about totally different things. Yeah, there were ships in the night, weren't they, in, 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 in some ways. Yes, please. Hello, I'm Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Okay, I'm just going to play, like, doubles out of it a little bit. Kind of, like, I voted for, obviously, but still I'm going to, like, point out some things that I noticed. Um, I kind of thought John's cross-examination was a little unfair because you literally were like, only say yes or no, and then he really...